What up? This is Josh Rubin from East West Alien Performance, and today I want to talk about acid reflux or GERD or whatever you want to talk about it, another school of thought. Now, of course, I do nutrition or we do nutrition with clients all around the world, and I do believe that people with acid reflux or hypochloridria, all these different things, it can be a physiological issue. It can be a nutritional issue. But what if, you know, you do the labs, you do the gastric string test, you take an HCL supplements, you know, etc., and it's not working. You do your test for H. pylori, and that's why you think you have acid reflux, etc., etc. None of this stuff is working. We always have to think about the person that's in front of us and think about, is this issue going on actual physiological issue? And we have to think about it from a broader sense. And I, this is where I think a lot of therapies kind of miss the mark. Well, I'm not here to kind of bash other therapies. I'm here to actually share with you what I learned in my fourth year of school of osteopathy in Canada on pathophysiology of the GI system. In osteopathy, we think about, is there a somatic to somatic relationship with what we find? Meaning, is it a tissue or a muscle, whatever, causing another tissue or muscle problem, somatic, somatic? Is a somatic visceral problem? Now, most people think somatic, somatic. That's most therapies. If I do this, if this is tight or this is weak or this is dysfunctional in a tissue, it's because the psoas is tight over here or it's because the rectus abdominis is inhibited. That's one way of looking at the body. And unfortunately, from my standpoint, you're really you know, missing a lot of key points because what if it's somatic visceral? What if it's a somatic problem causing a visceral organ dysfunction? What if it's a visceral to visceral dysfunction, an organ causing another organ issue? Or visceral to somatic. What if it is an organ issue causing a somatic tissue, you know, muscle problem? So we have to think about all these four different things when we're looking at our person, as well as all the pieces to their healing puzzle. Maybe it is nutritional, but what if I'm doing all these things? What if I'm doing the labs, the supplements, etc., and it's not working? Well, one thing I learned and I found pretty interesting is when we're talking about the esophagus. Now, there's many types of hernias. Of course, there's spigel and inguinal, etc. I'm talking more about the hiatal hernia. It's a diaphragmatic hernia where the upper part of the stomach actually pierces its way up through the diaphragm into the thorax. Now we get a dysfunction in the regulation of pressure gradients and that's important when we're looking at these people and this is actually why they're actually getting GERD. Now there's two types of hiatal hernias. We'll be talking about one, the sliding hernia, because it's actually most common in 90% of the population. The other one is the, uh, the rolling um, or the paraesophageal, where they actually are more asymptomatic um, and they actually don't get the acid reflux as one of their symptoms. Now, in a hiatal hernias in general, it's very common for people to have acid reflux, gallstones, peptic ulcers, and things like that. But the acid reflux is actually more common in the sliding hiatal hernia than the rolling. Now, if we think about the esophagus, it actually brings food from the mouth down to the stomach. It actually pierces, you have to think about those, all these things. It actually has an intimate relationship with the trachea. Um... It pierces the diaphragm around T11, so we have to think about what's going on at T11, typically T8 to T12 area. Is there enough neurovascular input going to the esophagus if there's a hiatal hernia? So seeing if there are any lesions or anything going on at T8 to T12, whether it's the facets, whether it's the joint itself, um, muscular attachments, viscera, etc., etc. Um, we have to think about other you know, relationships to the esophagus, not just the esophagus itself, but, you know, the liver, there's a left triangle ligament that actually hangs the liver off the diaphragm in the esophagus. And the, the liver itself is a large fluid organ, so it can actually pull on the esophagus and pull on the diaphragm. So we have to think about looking at the liver and the liver's relationships with everything else because it can have an indirect effect on the diaphragm in the esophagus. Um, now, when it comes to the hiatal hernia, typically what's going on is, and typically it's more aggravated in people when they're laying down or supine, and one of the treatment recommendations is, is having people to not lay down after eating or to try to, you know, lay down in more of a reclined kind of seated up position um, to prevent the sliding. So what's happening is the upper part of the stomach actually makes its way up through the lower esophageal sphincter into the esophagus and pierces through the diaphragm. So this is the esophagus and this is the diaphragm. The stomach actually makes its way up into the esophagus. Now this is a problem. This is why people get a hiatal, a hiatal, a hiatal hernia. Um, 
So it's it's basically making its way, the stomach is making its way into the thoracic cavity through the esophagus. Now this is a problem for many reasons because the esophagus is actually more striated in the upper part, in the muscularis part, to help with peristalsis. And it's more smooth muscle in the low part. Now, if food is sitting there and you're not breaking it down and you have this hyal hernia, this is dangerous because over time, the muscle in the cells of the smooth part of the esophagus can actually change their structure. And this is dangerous because over time, this can actually lead to certain types of cancer, dysphagia, achalasia, Barrett's esophagitis, etc. Because now the smooth muscle cells will actually change their structure into the cells of the stomach and actually change their makeup. So now we're actually going to start, in a sense, breaking down food in the esophagus where we shouldn't be breaking it down. It should drop it actually into the stomach. Now, this is why people actually get GERD because, and this is why in the para paraesophageal, the rolling, they don't. Because the lower esophageal sphincter, number one, the pressure gradient has actually diminished, you know, at that level. There's increased intra-abdominal pressure, which has a huge effect on this in things like coughing or pregnancy or obesity or bending over can actually exacerbate it. That's why there's a simple test to see if you have a hiatal hernia, which is the shoelace test. You bend over, kind of tie your shoelaces. Does that aggravate your symptoms? Typically, we can say that's indicative of a hiatal hernia. The reason they get GERD is because the stomach is above the lower esophageal sphincter or above the gastroesophageal junction. And this is why in rolling or paraesophageal, they don't get GERD because in this one, the stomach, if this is the esophagus and diaphragm, the stomach or the fundus in the greater curvature actually makes its way through the diaphragm from an anatomical defect into the thoracic cavity, sits next to the esophagus, and of course we can get a lot of mucosal blood pooling and things like that. But the stomach itself down here is actually below the gastroesophageal junction, and that's why they don't get acid reflux and they're asymptomatic. So it's very common with people that have a sliding hiatal hernia to have this gastric uh, reflux or acid reflux or whatever you want to call it because of that anatomical uh, or structural dysfunction that's going on of the stomach making its way into the esophagus and going above through the lower esophageal sphincter, diminishing pressures. And typically what you see, like I said, is um, sometimes developing GI disorders later on, sometimes, of course, later on developing certain types of dysphagia, difficulty swallowing. When we think about swallowing, we have to think about the esophagus itself, we have to think about the mouth, TMJ. We have to think about the sphenopalatine ganglion as well, which can have a huge indirect effect on in the esophagus and swallowing. And I hate all hernia because it feeds cranial nerves 5, 7, 9, and 12, which have a huge impact on swallowing. So working the sphenopalatine ganglion, its relationships to the sphena and the palatine and all the surrounding structures, is a huge benefit when someone has a hiatal hernia and has difficulty swallowing. And of course, people get epigastric pain, heartburn, and things like that. So what do you do? Well, of course, you can go to your doctor and get a barium x-ray, chest x-ray, if you have a periesophageal um, you need the chest x-ray to see what's going on, to see where the fundus is in relation to the esophagus. But with the sliding, some, there's some typical things that you can do. Of course, watch your, watch your posture, make sure you're not slumped over. Of course, losing weight, cutting out alcohol, um, stopping smoking. Uh, eating sm smaller meals more frequently is a benefit. Um, uh, not laying down after eating, of course, is a benefit. All these things can actually help people eliminate the hiatal hernia or prevent the symptoms of a hiatal hernia. But what do you do if you have a hiatal hernia? Now, of course, I go to Canada to practice true osteopathy, a manual-based medicine, hands-on medicine. It's not the U.S.-based osteopathy where you become a doctor. It is a five-year program. You have to write a thesis. But it's really based on the relationship of all the tissues in the body, the muscles, the ligaments, the veins, the arteries, the nerves, the, the muscles, the, the bones, the capsules, uh, the organs, the brain, the fascia, etc. It's the relationship and understanding of all that in the body and how the body is actually a system of autoregulation and how it's a system of systems. So how can we regulate this using our hands? Now, of course, you can't do this yourself. You have to find, if you can, which are far and few between, a European or Canadian trained osteopath that can use their hands over time to treat this. If not, I would find maybe a visceral massage therapist trained by the Burrell Institute or maybe a cranial th sacral therapist that can do visceral work. Because we have to start to look at some of the things I mentioned. We have to work on the sphenopalatine ganglion. 
and its relationship with the facial bones, as well as the cranium. We have to think about the diaphragm and work the diaphragm. We have to think about the pressure gradients because you have a cranial diaphragm in your head, thoracic cavity, abdomen, knee, and foot. So we have to work all those pressure gradients because now the pressure gradients are actually affected because of the hiatal hernia. We have increased intra-abdominal pressure in a diminished resting pressure at the lower esophageal sphincter, and this is why people get GERD. So working the pressure gradients in all the diaphragms is important. We have to think about adhesions above the esophagus that could be possibly pulling the esophagus up, such as the constrictors or all the different structures in the mediastium, which is kind of deep in this area. We have to think center versus periphery. In a simplistic sense, what is going on in the periphery, the lungs and things like that? Are they actually compressing the esophagus? So how can we work the periphery to actually take pressure, in a sense, off the esophagus to help indirectly affect the hiatal hernia? As I mentioned, we have to make sure we reestablish the neurovascular input to the esophagus through what's going on in the vertebrae, especially T8 to T12. And we have to think about the esophagus itself. It's actually a long tube. We have to think about everything. We have to work the tube itself. At the top of the tube, the bottom of the tube, at the tube itself, and what's going on inside the tube, which can easily be done with manual therapy. So we have to think about all these things when we're working with people. We have to think about, does my client have acid reflux? And is it because of physiological issue? Is it because of H. pylori? Is it because they're hypochlorhydric? Is it because they're actually producing too much hydrochloric acid? Is it nutritional-based, bacterial, or parasitic? Or is it actually a structural issue? Does my client actually have a sliding hernia? Is there a structural issue going on? And the use of manual therapy, maybe doing two, three, four, five, whatever amount of sessions they need to work the different diaphragms, work the pressure gradients, work centiverse periphery, work the sphenopalatine ganglion if they're having swallowing issues in the cranial nerves. Um, and working the tube itself, will that bring benefit to the client? And if they do have a hiatal hernia, those things and those things alone will actually help limit eliminate the reflux they're getting because the bottom line is they're getting reflux because the stomach has made its way in through the lower esophageal sphincter into the esophagus into the thoracic cavity which is causing the GERD because of altered pressure gradients and as I mentioned they don't get this in paraesophageal because the, the gastroesophageal sphincter is actually where it should be and the stomach itself where it meets the um, esophagus is actually still below it but the greater curvature is actually above it at the level of the esophagus. But because the sphincter is where it should be, they don't get GERD. So hopefully this YouTube is not too complex. If it is, do some research. But hopefully it sheds some light onto another school of thought on why people might have acid reflux. It's not always a deficient in supplements. It's not always deficient in hypochlorhydria or HCL. And it's not always H. pylori. Thanks for tuning in, and I'm out of here.